So hi everyone, welcome to the next lecture. Um, welcome to this next lecture in the course of management and information systems. In previous lectures, we've talked about uh, the role of uh, information when it comes to collaborating, to social media, to working online. And of course, all these technologies, uh, these options provide great opportunities to stay connected, to exchange information with each other, especially at these times. But they all do not only present opportunities, they also present certain risks. So today we're going to take a closer look at uh, information systems and information systems security. Um, why is that so important? Well, because in these days we're using more and more information and information systems that are vital to our businesses and organizations. Um, you might have heard the news uh, last Christmas that Maastricht University was the victim of ransomware locking uh, hundreds, thousands, almost all computers across the campus uh, and especially some of their critical systems and servers which means that they couldn't, that people couldn't access the applications anymore. Were uh, you know exams couldn't take place, um, the uh, the rosters, the schedules were not accessible, and eventually it also affected research and other applications. So it's that that attack, how unfortunate it was, actually shows a couple of things. First of all how much we depend on information technology and information systems to conduct our business, to do our jobs. At the same time, it also shows how vulnerable we are uh, as these systems become more and more complicated and more and more complex to manage. Um, so, uh, and the final part is if you look at how this attack happened through ransomware and phishing, it shows you that it is not just the responsibility of IT and IT staff to keep systems safe, but every user, every application, every part of the network plays a role in making sure that your systems, your tools and your information is safe uh, for people and for yourself. So today we're going to take a look at that. Uh, and especially in these days, it is uh, relevant because now in these times that we can't travel anymore, there is an upsurge in e-commerce, in digital applications, in a lot of tools that we use to conduct our business. So for a lot of business, they have made the sudden transition from uh, offline to the digital world. They started web shops, people have started digital services, they are moving their business online. And we'll talk a little bit more about this transition to e-commerce later. Um, but first of all, uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk a look at the risks that that brings because suddenly we're transitioning from uh, an organization that, you know, has, has limited uh, online presence or experience to something that fully depends on it in a very small time frame. Normally, you would start with pilots, you would develop these things over time, but now there is this sudden uh, handover, this sudden change. And that brings with it certain risks. So that's what we're gonna. Uh, that's why we're gonna talk about it about today. Uh, an example of this sudden shift and the risks it brings is actually with the Corona apps that are being developed. Uh, in one of the apps that's being developed here in the Netherlands, uh, a uh, the the apps that were being developed were asked to put their source code online, and in one of the source codes, people found a database uh, with stored uh, names uh, and uh, some personal information. So it contained email addresses and encrypted passwords. So it shows you that IT development, rapidly doing it can present certain risks. So it is very important then whatever you develop IT or you put IT solutions in place that you don't only examine the opportunities, but you also think about uh, the IT security and the development. So we're going to take a bit more about the opportunities in the in the chapter on e-commerce. We're going to talk more about the management and the uh, development projects and processes in IT development chapter. But today we're going to focus a little bit on IT security before we go into the opportunities. 
for the very basic reason that if people, once they start thinking about opportunities, it's very hard for them to look at the negative side. So we're going to start, or the, 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 the risks. So we're going to start looking at the risks before we start talking about the opportunities. Um, so first of all, let's talk a bit about several definitions. Uh, we often have talk about hackers and crackers in IT, and you could distinguish them uh, a little bit in two different things. So a hacker is somebody who's trying to gain unauthorized access to a computer. It could be anyone um, that is trying to, to break into systems. So originally hacking was something that, that people would do to write programs. They would try to find a way around operating systems. They would try to find loopholes so they could execute certain codes, not per se with the attempt to do harm, but just to find ways around certain barriers so they could create the functions and the programs that they wanted to. So anybody who's circumventing certain barriers would be considered a hacker. And people who do this, not with the intention to cause harm, we often refer to them as white hat hackers. So those are people who are using it, you know, are hacking because they want to accomplish something, because they see it as a challenge or because they want to help people make systems more secure. Um, that's different from uh, crackers or what we call black hat, hat hackers, which are individuals, organizations or teams uh, because they can be government organizations that break into computer systems or circumvent systems or barriers with the intent to do crime or to do damage. And those th that damage doesn't only have to be economically motivated. It doesn't have to be about money. It could also be because of political gains or ideological goals. I think you all know uh, this, you know, the, the, the things that are happening around the elections, uh, although people are not breaking per se into systems, but they do use IT technology to push a certain political agenda. So that's more about uh, influencing people, uh, social media uh, use and, and framing. But in a similar way, people could hack into systems to change certain messages. And we'll come back to that in, later on. So remember that there is hacking itself means circumventing certain barriers because you want to execute code or you want to accomplish something. It is that what you try to accomplish that determines if you're a white hat hacker or a black hat ha hacker. So somebody who is trying to commit a crime, do damage, change, uh, push their political agenda or influence people uh, are called black hack black hat hackers, sorry about that. So what are different ways of doing that? Well, first of all, a lot of things that people uh, look at is uh, technology. So of course you can look for vulnerabilities in systems, software that has certain loopholes that you could exploit. You could examine networks, like we call it packet sniffers. So they examine network traffic and try to filter out, for example, unencrypted passwords. We'll come back to that later, what we call with a man in the middle attack. There's key loggers, small pieces of software that are recording every key you press on your keyboard, including passwords. And there is brute force attacks, which means that essentially programs are going to try every single combination or a dictionary to try to guess your passwords automatically by repeating it. So those kind of, and there is a lot more of these techniques, but that's one set of hacking techniques that focuses on the technology. Um, so you can use, for example, uh, uh, software to detect software that is doing that. You can limit the number of times that people can attempt a password to prevent brute force from hacking. So there is even technology that helps you prevent uh, being uh, hacked through technology. And that's why it's so important to keep your software up to date to keep an eye on your network if there's any suspicious behavior and so on. However, there is another way that actually a lot of systems get compromised. That's by exploiting not the technology, but the people who use it, human weaknesses. So that way, we're not trying to attack the software itself or the system directly, but we're going through people that use the system. And actually, that's one of the biggest vulnerabilities there are these days. You can make computers super secure, but if people start making mistakes, it doesn't matter how secure your software and your systems are. 
to give you an idea, you might have heard about phishing. So that is people trying to trick you into do, to sending some information, to click a certain button, to visit a website. There is social engineering that is manipulating people. Um, there are examples of people who dress up as an employer employee, walk into a building, say they're from IT, and then they have they let other people use other people let them use their computers and their accounts. So that's called social engineering. You're not engineering the computers, you're engineering actually the people. So you're not hacking the system, you're hacking the people by making them believe you're somebody else. Um, another example that unfortunately when I was younger, I've done, and you see a picture of me in the, in the corner when I was a lot younger and had more hair, is shoulder surfing. So it would be a way that you actually just look over somebody's shoulder to guess their password or see what they're doing. Uh, what you see in the second picture is the library of my hometown of Maastricht. And actually, you used to have to pay to use the internet, although the librarians had a password that they could do to unlock the computer for you. So what we actually used to do is we sit with two friend, a friend of mine who used to sit next to each other. One of us let the computer crash on purpose and we would call for help from the librarian. Then the librarian would come in and enter that password, but they would shield the keyboard from my friend. However, I was sitting next to him and I could clearly see the password they were typing in. And the next thing you know, for the next three months, we had free internet access. Didn't involve any technology, didn't involve any hacking. It was just a bit of social engineering and shoulder surfing. And there are even examples of people hacking or getting information through going through dumpsters. Uh, by looking at shredded documents, by looking at papers, putting them back together, finding passwords, finding printouts, and so on. So um, we often think about technology and IT security as it's purely the technology, but it's actually the both the technology and the people. So remember again, when we talked in the past about these uh, four components of information systems, technology, data, humans, people, and organization and procedures. So the same applies to information security. You need to secure all four of these elements if you want to keep your system safe. Um, so think again about these four components. So what kind of crimes could you commit? Well, the most common one we do with uh, computer crimes is the stealing information. That information could be personal information that could be used to, to order on your behalf, to do identity theft, um, but it could also be a stealing of computer resources. So for example, being able to run certain programs in the background, we call that, for example, uh, or one of the examples of that being happening is called botnets. So in botnets, your computer is actually uh, running programs in the background, although you might notice it, not notice it to attack other computers. So they're not stealing information from you. They're just using your computer to attack other computers and systems. Um, so that unauthorized access, it's not, it's people circumventing getting access to systems with the idea to steal information or to use your computer to do other uh, crimes. Um, the other thing that people might do would be to modify information. So they could um, log into systems, uh, they could um, block websites. A ransomware is an example of this, where they change data and they encrypt it, for example, with the idea that you want, you want to extort people. So you will uh, need to pay them to unlock your systems. So that's uh, ransomware. Uh, it could also be defacing a website to make a public statement. So if people uh, uh, use your, if there's a, a, um, a vulnerability in your website software, it could be exploited and people could put a political statement on your website for example. So that's not so much about accessing it as more it is about changing information. Although nowadays you probably need to get unauthorized access to modify information. Um, so that data modification can happen in a lot of way. And I think a key thing to remember here is that it doesn't only have to be people from the outside. It could also people be from the inside. If there is an accountant who has access to the financial systems or the employee records in your HR department, what's preventing that person from subtly, subtly increasing their salary in the system? So it's not, it doesn't only have to be people from the outside hacking your system. 
It could also people be people within your organization that are accessing the information that are manipulating the systems. And it could be people who are un unhappy. It could be external people working within your company, contractors and so on. Um, it, it, it has happened on occasion that people who got a notice that they were fired use the last day in work to download all the files, delete all the files, encrypt all the files. Um, so the threat doesn't only come from the outside. It can only come, especially if you have larger organizations from the inside. An employee who gets fired, who might be uh, disgruntled or unhappy could, and has access to systems could use that access to cause quite a big damage to your organization. Um, an example of, of such an insider job, um, for lack of better word, but um, with the, not the intention to cause harm, not with the intention to modify information or financial gains, but purely from an ideological point of view, is Edward Snowden. So I'm sure you've heard this, you know the story, but Edward Snowden was working was contracted to the CIA. So he was working for a different company that was working and it was hired by the CIA to do work. And then um, Edward Snowden used partially his own uh, access and also was able to get access to other systems through his authorization and to learn about, to, to copy information. Now, technically he had access um, or gained this access, although his contract, you know, it, it, he was not authorized to do it and especially not authorized to take the information with him. Um, now, if you think about the motives here, they were not financially, they were not uh, with the intent to cause harm, at least to the CIA initially, uh, but they were there with an uh, ethical and altruistic motive to inform people. Uh, so it came from his ethical one. So again, it is not somebody who's been hacking from the outside. It is not somebody who's been um, was working there with the intent to cause harm, uh, but it was somebody who had access and used it uh, for, from an ethical point of view. Whether that's a correct thing to do is a different discussion. Um, but I show you this example to, to broaden your field of view that when we talk about hackers, it's not just nerds sitting in a room somewhere, you know, trying to attack the system from the outside. It is also people within organizations. And uh, as we said, it's it's a lot of times it's people. So there's uh, there's things like passwords, which is often an often used example. So and the picture here on the on the left, uh, you you see it's from an emergency operations center, I believe in Hawaii. And the guy's password is on that post-it note you see at the bottom of the screen in the red circle. So why is that password there? Well, probably it is hard to remember or it is complicated. And actually this was this picture, this image was taken from the news. So that password was broadcasted publicly before people realized that it was there. Why does it happen? Because on the other side, we're asking people to make very complex passwords. So the password must contain, like in the picture shows, a letter, uppercase symbol, a symbol. You have to change it every time. There's a lot of complicated rules if you want to create a password. So what I'm showing here is that there's always a trade-off between making things more secure by cre creating a lot of barriers and then the human behavior. If you ask people to make a very complicated password, the chances are higher they're going to write it down. If you put people, if you put a lot of barriers before people can access it, they probably start making copies, printing it, and taking it home or using different devices. So it's a fine balance between functionality and security. In in each of these steps, you have to consider the user and what is acceptable to them. The more barriers you in, you put up to keep your system safe, the higher the chances are that people either can't do their job or they're gonna find ways around it which are less secure. And this applies especially because nowadays people will start using more and more what we call own devices, mobile devices. Uh, it's also this trend is referred to in IT as bring your own device, B-Y-O-D. And that means that people will bring their own devices into work. And um, What's the risk, especially if you talk about mobile devices? Well, there are certain threats that didn't happen before. If you have a desktop computer, you don't lose it. It's in your office, unless people break in and steal it. Um, but, you know, your mobile phone gets lost more easily. Um, 
people store sensitive data on the mobile phones, but you don't know what security measures they have in place. Is it the fingerprint? Is it the code? Don't they have any code on it? Uh, people find ways around to manipulate their mobile phones, jailbreaking if you want to install certain apps. And others can, and you, people might install other software on mobile devices which are less secure and will still get access to certain files. And then people might use their mobile devices at home, in a coffee shop, outside somewhere on unsecure networks. Um, so this bring your own device poses another threat for organizations. Unless you provide them with devices and you completely lock them down, um, people will start using their own devices. And again, here you will see the trade-off between lock, giving them a device, providing them with the hardware, but limiting the functionality to keep it safe versus the ability for staff to do their own work on their own devices, being more productive, but less secure. And the last point here, the unsecure networks, is something that you might see a lot and that's well that's because what we referred to earlier has to do with what we call a man in the middle attack so if you go for example to a starbucks or a coffee shop you will see a wireless network an unsecured one or something that you can access it's your device will store that network as something that they can connect to in the future what people can do is they can create a network that looks like that network and that's called a fake access point. What will happen is that your device will connect to that access point and the traffic will get sent via somebody else's laptop, for example, the attacker. So that's why it's called a man in the middle attack. Somebody will be playing an intermediary in your internet traffic. It means that they can see the information that you're sending across. Um, so that is something that you will that that is specifically have to pay attention for when you're using public networks or uh, hotspots. So aside from the man in the middle attack, there's different. There's also alternate ways. It's computer viruses. So viruses. Uh, when we talk about computer viruses, they're actually small programs that install themselves in the computer and will start running and replicating themselves onto other computers. They will start looking for other computers that have similar vulnerabilities and start to exploit it. So replicating them via web servers or it could be via email attachments. So that's why we call the virus. It, it self replicates uh, either automatically if there's a vulnerability in the operating system or the network like happened in Maastricht University with ransomware or it could replicate because of a human intervention like emails getting forwarded or attachments. One of the things that people uh, you might hear about in the news when we talk about attacks is not only the phishing, people stealing information either through phishing or a man in the middle attack, but it's also really causing damage and, and attacking infrastructure. Uh, often this happens in the form of what we call DDoS, Distributed Denial of Service Attacks. What happens with Distributed Denial of Service Attacks is that a re when every time you visit a website or you go online, uh, you, you start an application with an internet connection, your device will make a connection with a remote server. In a Distributed Denial of Service Attack, many devices are connecting to this remote computer but they're not sending the right information i won't go into the technical aspects if you're interested in you can you can read about it but what happens is that a large number of requests get sent um, but the web server doesn't know where to answer them and eventually the web server will you know will not be able to handle all the requests and the traffic a lot of people, for example, one of the ways this has happened is with a botnet. Remember when I said earlier that one of the ways that people will, will attack you or one of the things that they could do is not only cause damage to your system, but use your system. That is what happens with botnet. People are using your computer to send a lot of requests to servers. So the servers get overloaded and go offline. And that's called the distributed denial of service attack. And there are nowadays, there are services like Cloudflare that use, that use certain technologies, extra capacity and detection mechanisms to prevent this from happening. So they can detect a distributed denial of service attack and lock certain sites off. 
Um, so think about the distributed denial service as everybody ambushing a store, this time not to buy the toilet paper, but to get a website. But there's so many requests happening at the same time and, and the people are not, the computers that are connecting are not clear, their requests are incomplete, that the server gets overloaded and goes offline. Why is that an issue? Well, it, you know, it's of course, unfortunately for your business or for your, uh, for an organization, if the website is not available and goes down. However, that's not the only thing that can happen. There are, for example, around the world, several uh, servers that uh, make sure that you don't have to remember the IP addresses, the numbers of each device, but that you can type a name in, a domain name. So uh, www.google.com, for example. That is made possible by a system called uh, DNS. Uh, and DNS uh, is a is uh, domain name service system. So that translates, actually serves as a phone book, translating a name to a certain number that identifies a server. So around the world, there are a few of these servers located, what we call the root servers. So they are the big, you know, they are the ones who maintain the top level records of the DNS. Too much technical detail, but once we start attacking those, not only do those, because those servers will go offline, but actually a lot of the other servers depend on that DNS system to function. So if you start attacking a D DDoS attack on DNS uh, servers, especially the, the major ones, the, the root servers, it will cause for problems for a lot of websites that the service might be still operate uh, might be still operating but because the phone book is offline the computer doesn't know how to reach them so that is what has happened in 2016 uh, for example and uh, caused an outage in a large portion uh, for the internet um there are a few other ways that people can get information from you so we've talked about um you know, causing damage, financial gain, ethical concern. But nowadays people are also trying to get information from you, either to extort you, to, uh, you know, to use your financial information. And there's different ways that people can get that information from you. And uh, one is called spyware. And that actually, as the name implies, is not s software meant to, um, uh, to attack you, but software to spy on you. So it monitors what you do, which websites you visit, what information you enter on those websites, and even what letters you type on your keyboard. So a key logger that we talked about earlier is an example of spyware. Another way that people uh, try to get information from you is spam. So spam is, is the massive amount, like sending emails to, to tens of millions of users and the hope that somebody would, would click a link, uh, install a program or uh, send some information. So it's part of a phishing attack. Although nowadays spam, it used to be a lot of just, uh, they send a lot of emails they're hoping somebody would click, but they're getting more and more precise. So they're now actually using information from you to make a very tailored uh, spam message to you. So it's not only always recognizable anymore. So spam still means that it's unwanted unsolicited email but it's becoming harder and harder to recognize because they're getting more and more refined more and more personal because they have more information on you for example from websites um, then there's cookies you might have heard about or you might have seen the wall so what cookies actually means is a small file that is stored on your computer and that could be for reason for example to store some information from a website locally such as which items are there in your web card. But uh, cookies can also be used to track you across the internet. Uh, Facebook famously uses used cookies. They now use something else, fingerprinting. But they used cookies to track you across different websites. Websites would check if that cookie is present. Ah, then that's this user from Facebook. So it can contain sensitive information like credit card numbers. So cookies uh, hinder your anonymity on the internet. It, allows websites to track you even if you're visiting different websites and nowadays all that information out there is identity theft 
because people are sharing more and more information online. Um, so people could steal your credit card information, social security number, bank account, and a lot of other information and impersonate you. Doesn't mean that they will always, you know, go out and pretend to be you, but they could use your information to buy products or to manipulate certain information or order things. Um, so that happens a lot and it's, and it's often people will use a combination of techniques. It is phishing in combination with cookies in combination with some social engineering. All these things combined with the goal to get information from you and eventually, you know, cause financial harm or extortion and then gain money from it. So, um, especially as people are posting a lot of private information on social media, it becomes easier and easier for organizations to obtain that information from you and, and pretend to be you or manipulate you in some way. Uh, that's why we're you know, increasingly using biometrics or other ways to verify your identity, not only through a passport or password, but also fingerprints, iris scans and so on, or a combination of factors. So the more combinations you put together, the harder it will be for somebody else to pretend to be you. However, you also have to keep in mind, again, the usability. The more barriers you put up, the functionality will go down for people. Um, there is a, a lot of, nowadays, it's not only about hacking anymore. As we mentioned in the beginning, social engineering is a big part. And, uh, you know, the loss of privacy also means that people can find more information about you, not with the intent to cause you harm or like physical damage or steal your information or your credit information, but to bully you, harassment, stalking and so on. So it, it is becoming easier for people to follow you online, to uh, find personal details about you that they can exploit. So uh, cyber bullying, cyber harassment uh, and cyber stalking overlap with each other. So they actually cyber, uh, cyber harassment could be with the intent to bully you and cause emotional distress, for example. And cyber stalking might be necessary to get enough information from you to do cyber harassment. Um, cyber stalking might not always be visible because somebody can follow you on via social media and you might not recognize it. Um, but nowadays there's more and more laws against these, uh, these kinds of effects. So here again, the tricky part is when does it become so uh, harassment and bullying and stalking as people are putting more and more inf personal information about themselves online, you know, you're give, willingly giving up a piece of privacy. So be very mindful that whatever you do online will never disappear. Even if people just see it for a second, they could take a screenshot and save it. Uh, servers keep records of everything. So be mindful that everything you do online can and will be used, you know, against you or people could use it against you at some point. Um, so that is something to be very aware of. Um, and even despite the best intent, uh, systems can still make flaws. Uh, the, um, the data that is, you often see that it gets leaked contains passwords, email addresses, and so on. So this was already a long time, longer time ago where Dropbox, the accounts, millions of accounts were leaked from their database and people had access to it. Um, uh, of course, the email addresses uh, were leaked, the users, but the passwords were hashed and salted. And that actually means that the passwords themselves were not visible, but the encrypted version of the password was uh, visible. And then it was salted, which means the encryption key had a sort of random element to it that was not, uh, was not known. So people could not you know, really discover what the password is, even if they would try to encrypt it and compare it. It's a bit of technical stuff, but uh, it, when you, people see uh, passwords are leaked, you know, always check if they mean plain passwords, which means that you can just read the passwords or if they've been hashed and encrypted and salted. If you want to know if you're a victim ever of such a data leak, there's this great website, haveibeenpwned.com. 
you can go there, you can type in your email address and you will see which leaks your email address has appeared. So you know if that information of you has been leaked. So if you haven't checked it, go to the website haven'tbeenpwned.com. You can see the link at the top and check your account to make sure it's safe. And if you are there and you haven't changed your password, then make sure you do it. Now, how do you keep things safe? That's actually a hard part because software and systems engineering is on the one hand becoming easier and more accessible, which means that more and more people are able to build stuff, which is a great development in itself, allowing people to build systems, to build software. You can make an app fairly easy without knowing any line of code, or you could take an online course and learn how to program. However, building something is very different from building something safe. And all too often we see that things that have been developed as a prototype, as a quick fix, end up being part of a production, being part of a system. So creating software is fairly easy, but creating something that is safe, secure, stable, doesn't have vulnerability is hard and is often hard to convince your management that that's worth the investment, that the extra time needed to make something secure outweighs the financial cost of a potential leak that could happen. Because a lot of, as I, as I said in the beginning, people look at the opportunities, but it works, right? It looks great, just let's do it. So, however, as systems run longer and get expanded and new functions get added, the more complex the code becomes, the harder it will be to make it secure. The more, the bigger, what we call the attack surface will be, the more ways that there are to penetrate your system. And I like this clip of XKCD when they ask uh, engineers like, are you know, uh, about airplanes. They're very safe, they're redundant, they're as resilient. It's one of the safest ways to travel. Elevators, super safely engineered, and every engineer in the elevator industry will tell you it's very safe to use them. But if you would ask software engineers about computerized voting, they will tell you that's terrifying. Don't do it. And actually it's ironically that often it's software engineers and computer scientists who will tell you it's a bad idea to use software for this or to run into it. I'll give you an example here that you might recognize here in the Netherlands. We're thinking about building a Corona app. Now, aside from what I personally think of this, if you look at the comments online, it is all the technologies, all the computer scientists and a lot of engineers that will tell you it's a bad idea. Don't do it. And they've, you know, scientists have written letters. Um, well, they don't say don't do it, but be very mindful and don't do it quickly. And as I showed you in the beginning, what has happened when we tried to do it quickly, a database with emails was leaked. Now that doesn't show vulnerability in the app per se, but it does show how easy it is to make a mistake in software development with big consequences. And in these uncertain times, we're not go it's not wise to build something quickly, uh, uncertain and a large scale that is crucial to our health. Um, so that's even aside from the social aspects of such an app, uh, building something that is this complex, that has this profound impact on people's life is very dangerous. Um, so, you know, think when people say, oh, let's build something quickly, really think about what it means in terms of security. Another example is that if you not only look at one piece of software, which might be very strong uh, and, and well built, it is often that this software is used with other systems and that makes it vulnerable. Let's look at an example that before, like long time ago, you got water from the tap to get that water another company would provide a drinking water to you and that drinking water company had pumps operating that depend on the electrical supply. So you had electrical supplies provided power to the pumps, the pumps pumped the water and gave water to you. And each of those companies had their own systems. They had their own, they were, they were managing, they were maintaining their own systems, the software, the, the maintenance, the people were trained and so on. And if something would happen, we would know that if the people made a mistake, the software went online, that we know the electricity would fail, then the pumps would go offline. It was easy to see the risks. But nowadays, actually, our system and our society is much more complicated. Getting water from the tap, you have electricity, you have a water supply company, you have the maintenance that's being outsourced. 
And all these relations exist between different companies. The electrical company gets the software from a software developing company. That software developing company uses the networks of KPN to access the systems. A uh, telecommunications provider allows sensors in the, net, in the water network to measure the quality. So there's now not just a simple line of dependencies, there's a lot of interacting, interacting dependencies and relationships. And if one of those fails, actually it's very hard to assess what could potentially fail down the line. So it's harder to trace the problems and to oversee the risks that we're taking. We don't know what depends on uh, each other. So an example of that would be the 112, the emergency number um, uh, disruption we had last summer. It was, it's a very complicated network um, that where a lot of systems depend on each other and a small mistake, a small software update in a subsystem can have cascading and major effects for the, the overall function of the system. And to give you an idea, this is a network diagram of part of a mobile operator. So every single square here is a system and a subsystem. And all of these systems need to function in order for you to make a phone call. So that, and just one of these systems going offline because somebody made an update or, or set a parameter wrong in the software means that the whole system will go down. So that shows you as, you know, you, your single piece might still function, but because we're connecting software, connecting systems, it actually makes us more and more vulnerable. Because as we said in the beginning, we're creating a bigger attack surface. And nowadays in the background, the, the animation you saw running is cyber attacks that are happening between uh, organizations and countries at the moment around the world. So imagine the more and more systems you connect, the bigger your system becomes, great, more functions, more services for your users and your customers, but also the more vulnerable you become because only one of the systems have to be attacked, compromised, and the effects will be cascading through your entire surface.